Um, our first presenter today is Dr. Carrie Ann Platt. She is a professor in the Department of Communication and, and she's also the Associate Dean for the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, this is pretty neat that we get Dr. Platt with us today. She's the 2020 recipient of our NDSU Peltier Award for Innovative Teaching. Um, it recognizes faculty who use teaching techniques that have contributed to enhancing the educational experience of our students at NDSU. She teaches classes in media studies, pedagogy, and qualitative research, and she's been here at NDSU for 13 years. She's well known by faculty and students here at NDSU as a leader in effective and innovative teaching. If there's an event about good teaching, Dr. Platt is usually a presenter. She's gonna share ideas with us today about effective teaching, and hopefully you'll get some ideas that you can take back and use in your classrooms this fall. So please welcome Dr. Platt. Thank you for the super kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here and working with you all today. I am in the spirit of active learning and technology and innovation, going to be using a Mentimeter. Has anyone used that before in the classroom or as a participant? Ooh, we're all gonna learn something new today. So it works on a smartphone. So you can pull out your phone for this presentation. I know everyone is gonna be super great about paying attention even if the screen is out. It also works on a laptop computer if you don't have a smartphone. And if you don't have a smartphone phone or a laptop computer, I've set up many of the questions to allow multiple entries. So you would be able to input into the device of the person sitting next to you if they're willing to share that with you. So I'm gonna get it uh, started and it should show you exactly where you need to go. Fingers crossed that the technology works. So the uh, URL that you're going to use for your phone or for your computer is menti.com. If um, it's too small up here, it's M as in Mars, E N T I.com. And it's going to ask you to input a code, which is shown up here, 7522-9911. And if you could give me an actual in real life thumbs up once you have accessed it, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I see that y'all are doing the virtual thumbs up too. That's great. You can see that there's reaction icons at the bottom there. Also kind of strange. I don't know what that LCEP is, but we're just going to roll with it today. Is there anyone having any trouble accessing it? Getting on our wireless, using their cell phone in the building. Sometimes that can be challenging. Looks like it's working. Okay. <laughs> I don't, what do you think that that cat icon means? That you're a cat? Okay, we can see how many cats are present. A lot, there's a lot of cats present in the room today. This is so fun, yeah. I don't, it asked me if I wanted to put the reaction icons on my title slide, I said, why not? And indeed, that was the right choice because y'all are using them, okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna go forward and um, you heard a little bit about me as I was introduced. So I am half-time professor, half-time administrator. I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. This also gives us a chance to start using the system. See who's represented in the room. This icon makes it almost look like it's a battle, but pretty, pretty even right now. Awesome, I have another choice in there, but I don't see anyone choosing it. So I have a stronger sense of who's present in the room. I started teaching as a master's student and I can remember being incredibly freaked out in the August of that year, thinking about like how close I was in age to my students and I was gonna go in the classroom and I was gonna be in charge. This just seemed completely inconceivable to me. So I remember walking into the classroom that first day. Um, it was a, a discussion section for public speaking and just reminding myself, I have one more degree than they do. I have one more degree than they do. I can do this. And then I did that again after I had gone through my master's program, my doctoral program and was hired at NDSU. One of the first classes that I taught here was of doctoral students. And that just seemed very strange to me that I having recently been a doctoral student 
I think my degree was posted like the 19th of August was going to go in and suddenly be a professor to doctoral students. And again, I said to myself, one more degree. I have the PhD. I have one more degree. I can do this. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is not just effective teaching strategies, but also things you can do to help bolster your level of comfort and confidence in the classroom, right? Things you can do to connect with your students in a way that builds that community, but still enables you to maintain authority as a teacher in the classroom, recognizing that people are coming in with different levels of teaching experience, different levels of experience being a graduate student, different age levels, like everyone comes from a different place, but the strategies we're gonna talk about today should be helpful for you, regardless of the position you're in, if you're feeling a little bit freaked out about it or if you're feeling more confident. Okay, so I know relatively we have a few more doctoral students than masters, but a good split. What type of teaching are y'all gonna be doing either this semester or this year? Ooh, we've got a few folks who are selecting the other option. Are you willing to speak up and share? what other is, because I was pretty sure I was not fully comprehensive in the categories. Yes, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so up in the air right now. All right. Uh, are, uh, are other people who are in that yellow other category here, are you also to be determined? Is there anyone who has an assignment that I have not covered? A recitation section. Okay. Yeah, so I would say a lab or discussion would, would cover that, but thank you for using that word because I don't always grab the correct one. So lab discussion recitation section, recognizing that that's a little bit different than the 15 um, folks who are going to be grading in someone else's course, so you don't have as much student contact necessarily, or the seven people who, this is so exciting, right, get to have their own course and develop their own syllabus and make, you know, most of their own policies, think up assignments, et cetera, different situations. So it seems like here in the room today, majority of folks are going to be running a lab discussion or recitation section. Uh, a lot of people grading, few people instructor in their own, and some people waiting to hear. So I will still aspire to give you tips that you could employ across any of these, no matter what your assignment ends up being. Okay. One more in the, the demographics. I got to see a nice hands up survey of which college folks were in. But here I'd like to know a little bit more about, uh, so this could be thought of as like the major, so calm history, HDFS is human development and family science for those who are new to NDSU. It's so pretty the way it uses the colors and rearranges everything. So if you have put in the same entry as someone else, it's going to make it bigger to show sort of the number of folks who are represented. You can see a really great range of programs. Uh, IME is industrial and mechanical engineering. Does that sound right? Did I get that correct? Wow, there's a whole lot of programs represented here today. That's awesome. Okay. So I'm going to have you for a moment take your eyes away from this screen or the screen in your hands and refer to the, the handouts that you have. I apologize because I am responsible for the one that has probably more text on it than anything else that is in your folder. It has my name near the top. It talks about fundamentals of effective teaching. Once you've got it, if you could hold it up in the air, and show it to me because I don't have a cat icon here. If you're still searching, you can look around. People can say, okay, I'm looking for something that has a lot of words on it. I put that handout together because I want to be able to give you so many details on what we know is effective when it comes to instruction. Things that we know from repeated uh, scientific studies that enable students to learn material faster, to retain it, and to understand things at a greater depth. 
I find sometimes when talking to uh, faculty audiences that there is a, a strong resistance to the idea of moving away from a mode where we are primarily lecturing to a mode that encompasses more um, of what our fabulous graduate dean was talking about of the students doing things, the students discussing, working on problem sets, working together as, as peers. I don't have that experience as much with folks who are like yourselves, graduate uh, TAs, people teaching their own courses. And it may be because you've just had more experience in educational systems where you were an active learner. You have had a chance to practice it. It's not necessarily as uncommon for you, but again, that varies. People come out of different educational systems. And so the reason that I've given you this very wordy handout is because I want you to have this information without me spending the 45 minutes that I have with you today reciting it to you. I recognize that you can read. I recognize that you are overwhelmed right now and will likely be coming back to some of your teaching materials as you get ready to teach or as you encounter specific teaching challenges. So I've given you that handout as a reference during the presentation today and later on. I'm gonna pick out three things that I think are particularly important, especially as we move into this first week of classes to focus on today, to work with, to apply, because my goals for this presentation are for you to be able to take some of the stuff that we know about effective teaching and apply it regardless of whether you're doing a recitation section, teaching your own class, if you are teaching in history or microbiological sciences, it can be applied across all of those different teaching contexts. And I wanna give you a chance to practice that and to try. So you'll wanna have that handout out to reference as we go along, cause it will be helpful for you. Okay, so one of the uh, early top items there, I can look at my handout here. The first one talks about the 555 rule. And this has to do with how you can best utilize the time you have allotted. You may have a 50 minute, you know, lab or recitation section that that's the only time you're going to see students during the week. You have 50 minutes together. And so thinking about these five minute increments, ooh, people are already responding. Awesome where you have five minutes to chat with students, right? Before the class gets started, you have the first five minutes of the time together and you have the final five minutes, how you can make best use of that time. The reason that the first five minutes focuses on kind of chatting is because we know that if you are able to connect with students, they are more likely to do better in your class and they're more likely to be engaged because they see you as someone who is, you know, obviously smart, obviously the instructor, the TA, but also someone who is human, someone that they can come to when they're struggling. And so one of the first questions that I'm asking here, and you're welcome to put in a response uh, if you have not yet, is thinking about those first five minutes, what are some of the things you could chat with students about? I think it's going to let you put in three possible topics. You don't have to put in all three, but if you can think of a few. The weather is very prominent right now. Yeah, I think especially in North Dakota, Minnesota, the weather always gives us uh, something we can talk about. Homework, problems in life, sports seeing some things that are specific to the classes themselves. So now that we're seeing some of the options up here, you've input, inputted some of your ideas. I'd like you to chat briefly with the person sitting next to you, or if you're a table of three, you can just chat as a full table. Assess the options here, because I think that there are all sorts of great topics, but I'm also seeing a few that we would want to be careful about as instructors when it comes to, to chatting with students. So as a group, as a pair, whoever you are chatting with, look at what the options are and pick out what you think might be kind of like the best two or three and one in which we might want to tread carefully. And when I say tread carefully, I don't mean like this is a bad topic. I'm not telling anyone that you submitted a wrong answer or a bad topic, but there are certain things that can turn into a conversation that you weren't expecting. And so you just wanna have that in mind ahead of time. So I'll give you a few minutes to chat, assess these topics, pick your best two or three, and one at least that you might wanna be careful about when chatting with students. 
Okay, so the first round we're gonna go through. If you are the spokesperson of the table, please raise your hand. I think some people have been voluntold, but that's awesome. I'm excited to have you participating. Okay, so right now we're gonna go around and we're gonna identify at least one topic that we thought was a surefire hit that we could see ourselves using maybe across, maybe it's across different fields, maybe it's something that's specific to your field. If you're sitting in like a disciplinary based uh, group. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on like this half of the, I feel like I can't walk too far away from the podium because of the camera and the microphone, but I'm gonna focus on this half of the room for surefire topics. And then this half is going to identify for me, tread carefully, okay? What topic, surefire? The weather, okay, definitely agree. Campus events, something that you could like let people know what's going on or people could share cool things that they've been doing. Just a, a general, how are things going? Opportunity to troubleshoot. Yeah, I like it. And I'm sorry that you did. I like actually that you didn't reach consensus because that shows that there is some good debate and discussion going on. Yeah, that's awesome. You wanna have more ideas than you can do stuff with. So thank you, behind. Okay, so referencing something that happened temporarily. Are you the volunteer? Okay. Sports in general, like campus sports. How about them bikes? Okay. <laughs> All sorts of sporting things we could talk about. Yep. Yeah, so trying to think about something that the class may have in common, but is specific to either the major or that course. Awesome. Okay, so an opportunity to do like in-class office hours. I like it. Back in the corner. Pets. Yeah, that's, that's true. That is an element of Zoom that I really love, like the cat cameos and the dogs and the opportunity to do show and tell with pets. So people just talking about pets in class, probably not bringing them into class like we did in Zoom, but being able to talk about it. I like it. Thank you. Yeah, so referring to like a recent event or something that may recently be happening for students, definitely. Uh, we're going to do one more of a, a surefire topic, and then I'm going to move over to tread carefully. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking, especially as the fall semester starts, like what did you do over summer break? Did you, anyone travel anywhere? Cool. That's a great idea. Okay. Back table topic. We might want to tread carefully. Various rashes, are you saying as the instructor on the instructor's body? Okay, yeah, so don't comment on rashes. I think that can, that's what everyone is gonna remember now from the session, yeah. Don't comment on rashes. <laughs> okay, no, you're, you gotta start it off strong, thank you. Yeah, so topics needing to, having to do with politics and that was one, um, so like COVID was up here, right? masking and all sorts of stuff we're talking about these days, I think we need to be careful about because there may be strong opinions. If you're in a political science course, maybe politics makes more sense to talk about. In other courses, I would not use that necessarily as my kind of warm up students type of question. Table here. Okay, so we're getting all the controversial topics. So if it's not a religious studies class, then yeah, not necessarily talking about religion and that uh, like, did you go to church on Sunday? Wouldn't be your weekend question, right? If we were avoiding that. Yep. Okay. So back to this table. The same religion. Okay. Uh, here. Yeah. So this is a, a really great uh, piece of, or sort of like topic to think about. 
I think it's perfectly okay to talk about pop culture, but you want to make sure you're not making the assumption that everyone knows it. So if people are discussing it, trying to bring others in or clue others into what it is that you're talking about can be useful. And also nowadays with just how technology is, we have fewer common pop cultural ideas or kind of we're not all watching the same TV shows in a way that people may have 20 years ago. So not always using pop culture. There's some like People mention Disney movies here. That may be something that's big enough that people have encountered it and everyone could vote for their favorite or least favorite, like biggest earworm of a Disney song. But be keeping in mind that not everyone grew up in America with American pop culture is a really important point. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, what? Uh, would that be something you don't want to talk about? That was why I was confused. Sorry. Are you not wanting to talk about hobbies or? Okay. Okay. So, so hobbies might be something that not everybody shares. So might not work exactly as a, as an opening topic. That's a good point. Did anybody talk about uh, sort of gray areas or danger areas when it came to weekends saying like, how was your weekend? What did you do over the weekend? Seeing some nods. Yeah, and I think you can also frame it. So you can say, anybody have any weekend plans, you know, that they can share that's classroom appropriate and saying things like, we're not necessarily going to be talking about what might be considered illegal activities based on the ages of the students in your class or things that might make others uncomfortable. I still think that weekend plans can be a good discussion as long as you are maintaining that line of professionalism, right? Your ultimate goal is for students not to volunteer information about what would be a legal activity or, you know, medical information that you probably shouldn't be privy. Now I'm just thinking about the rash answer. That one's new. I've never heard that one before. Um, okay. So I am happy to both hear you come up with a number of different topics because you wouldn't want to use the same topic every time, right? I could come into the classroom and I could use this one and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you respond here. And I also wanna let you know that, oops, I'll go back. If you are not a donut eater, you can put your favorite kind of pastry or sweet roll. Ah, uh, Long John. I had to get used to that because I grew up in Montana. So like, it would be called a bar there. If you got the one that has the maple frosting on it, it was a maple bar. And it was really, I came here and I was like, what Long John, what is this thing? Oh, it is my beloved maple bar just by a different name. Oh, now I'm hungry for donuts. Okay, so you could, you could do something like this. You could collect information. You don't have to use something like Mentimeter. You could just ask people like, what are your favorite donuts or breakfast foods? Um, sometimes if I have a small class and I am feeling uh, particularly uh, generous as an instructor, I might bring donuts on the last week of classes. This information and intel is actually helpful for me to have then. But even if I weren't going to do that, it gives you something to talk about of like, well, what is it about the long john? And then people can passionately defend their like choice of, of sweet donut. It gives you the opportunity for folks who are new to the Fargo-Moorhead area to let them know that Sandy's Donuts is the best purveyor of donuts in the area. I will, I will argue with anyone about that. Is there another place? Anybody have another favorite donut shop that's not Sandy's if you're from this area? See what I did there? I didn't make it inclusive. People are like, I'm not gonna fight with her. I just met her, but yeah. So good choices here when it comes to donuts. I'm gonna give you another thing to weigh in on just to show you some different examples and how you can sometimes use uh, information collection. And this is a different form. You may need to pinch a little bit on the screen. And essentially what I'm asking you here is when you think about like your favorite classes or learning experiences, do you prefer to be working on like a question or a problem that has one right answer? Or do you get more excited about working on questions or problems that have many possible right answers? And then once you've decided that, you want to think about, do I like working with other people on this question that has many right answers or this question that has one right answer? Or do I prefer to work by myself? So you would put your preference by tapping that part of the screen. Is it working? No, oh, Mentimeter, you failed me. What is it? What does it do? Just a blank screen. Okay, watch this. We're gonna improvise. 
Raise your hand if you like working toward the one right answer. Problems where you have, raise your hand proudly. I sometimes enjoy that. Okay, people who like working on problems that have many possible right answers. I am surprised by this, but I'm glad that I asked. So this, this is great. Still, we have different representation. Is there anyone who would be more in the middle? Like sometimes you like the right answers. I like proud hands in the back. Okay, I see a bunch of people looking at me saying, you didn't give me that option. I didn't know I could vote for that. All right, people who prefer working with others when it comes to these questions or problems. I don't know, is this like an introvert extrovert question? Maybe people who prefer working by themselves. Okay, this is a little bit more evenly split. Okay, people who like a mix of, I sometimes like working with others and sometimes I just need my own space. Oh, that was the dominant, okay. So we're, um, what is that? There's introverted, there's extroverted, and then is it ambiverted? Ambivert, okay, so we have a large room of ambiverts, okay. So this is helpful to know. Again, this is an example of information you could collect or talk about in kind of that initial time period that would help you as an instructor. And it also gives you something to talk about with students where you'd say, oh, that's interesting. Like what makes you say sometimes together, sometimes alone, and you are having these conversations that help you start to build not only a relationship with your students, but also help students build a relationship with each other. Because they look around and they're like, whoa, everyone is ambiverted. This is very exciting. I'm gonna make some friends who will know that I'm not always gonna be ready to go and hang out with them. Okay. So I'm gonna move down to another strategy on the handout. The one we were moving away from is, how can you start building community in your classes the next one I'm gonna talk about is the importance of explaining your pedagogical rationale or answering the why question. So often we make the assumption that the material we are covering or teaching or working with is important and students should know it's important. Why else would we be teaching it as they come into our classroom? But what you will find is it will go so much better if you take the time to explain why the either the class or the topic, the concept, the assignment is important for students. So I'm gonna give you a moment here. So we have a great topic there, introduction to grain drying storage and handling. But what I want you to do and what you're inputting is why does it matter? Like why should students learn about grain drying storage and handling? What is it? help them do when it comes to either their other courses, their possible careers, their lives as citizens in what is right now a very like challenging and difficult environment. And if you can get the topic and the reason in, I know it's a small box. If I could design Mentimeter, I would make the big box there. But I also think that there's value in learning how to do it concisely. So seeing a connection here for scientific method to what else they'll be doing in graduate school. Yeah, the cardiovascular system, pretty important to know how that works if you're a nurse, absolutely. So seeing lots of connections to later courses, some people talking about what you need in your profession. multiple sentences here. Awesome. I love how serious y'all are taking this. So once you've had a chance to input it, I want you to practice explaining it out loud to someone sitting at your table. So that can be, we can do it in pairs if you have more than three people, or if you have three people, you can just talk. Every person gets a chance to say. So today we're going to be learning about the cardiovascular system. It's important to know more about how the system works because, so you wanna, you, you know, it's gonna feel funny, right? Like you're pretend teaching, but the more you practice doing it, the easier it's gonna be when you're standing in that classroom. So everyone gets at least 30 seconds to share and then we'll come back together. Microbes can live without us, but we cannot live without microbes. I love it, it's so concise too. Okay, so here's a question for you. Did it feel different to say it out loud compared to when you were typing it into your phone? Yes, no, about the same. 
it seemed like your explanations were a bit longer when you were talking out loud. You had to look at someone, right, while you were speaking to see how they were. If they were nodding along saying, yes, I agree, microbes seem to be very important. So you were thinking about your, your audience. And so again, the take home here is you are going to get more buy-in, greater engagement from students if you explain to them why the stuff that you are teaching that day matters. So it's not just a first day activity where you come in and you say, evolution is really important to understand, so please pay attention for 16 weeks. It is an everyday activity where you say, today we're going to be covering this. This information is helpful for you because of this reason. Sometimes that reason is you'll do better on this assignment that's due in two weeks, or you'll do better on the exam that we're having in the middle of the semester. Sometimes it's you will perform better in your courses. You will be a better professional if you really take public speaking seriously. But always thinking about that why. Why are you asking them to do it? Why are you asking them to pay attention to you? Why does it matter? It's so important. What term do students, and you may have yourself have used this word before, what term do students apply to something that they are being asked to do in the class and they don't understand why? It doesn't seem to connect to anything or have a point. What do they typically call that? In the back. It is busy work, yes. The antidote to being accused of busy work is to explain to students why you are asking them to do something. So explain why you're covering something. As you introduce an assignment, make those connections as well. It's going to really help and it will make it, will make it so at least a greater percentage of students are buying and taking it seriously and less likely to call it busy work. Okay. So we're going to move on to the last strategy that I'm going to talk to you about, but I will first give you the opportunity to respond to this slide. So this slide here is meant to be an example of something that could be used in a class. It was mentioned in my introduction that I teach classes on technology, public understanding of technology, how technology influences our mental health, our relationships. And so we know that from the research that's been done in that area that social media use is not uniformly great or uniformly terrible for you. That often it depends on what it is you are doing, how you are using that particular social media platform, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Instagram, whether it's TikTok, the way in which you're using it matters. And so here I'm gonna have you assess these various uses, uses, obviously not exhaustive, but just a few examples of things that have been studied and have you pick out what you think has the most positive impact or the level of positive impact on mental health and what you think has um, sort of a, a greater likelihood to actually make you unhappy or not boost well-being when it comes to social media. I'm glad to see this one is working, the one that lets you drag. So once everyone at your table has weighed in via Mentimeter, talk amongst yourselves for a couple minutes about why you ranked things the way that you did and see if you can come to consensus at the table about at least what might what has been found to have the greatest boost on your happiness and what has the least or is most likely to make you kind of unhappy when it comes to social media. So we're looking for the extremes right now least positive impact, most positive impact. Talk amongst yourselves, see if you can come to consensus on the extremes at least. Sounds like y'all have been working ahead. You may, be, you may be ready to go. One of the things I love about the way that this slide displays is it shows you not just kind of like, um, like the average score, right? To give you a sense of where the room is, but the, it shows you the distribution as well. How, how much was clumped around that average score versus more distributed. And we're seeing some different answers across the room. Okay, so we're gonna use show of hands here. I don't, I don't have my little icon things on the screen that I can use. So we'll just use show of hands. So I'm gonna go through the, the five uses of social media or practices here. And please raise your hand if your table voted that to be the thing that makes you happiest, right? That uh, social science would say, you should try to do more of this if you want to improve well-being when it comes to social media use. So how, raise your hand if as a table you selected commenting on other people's posts as the thing that makes you happiest with social media use. How about keeping in touch with friends? Yep. Uh, liking or favoriting other people's posts? 
ooh, our distributions are very different now that we've talked to one another. Looking back at old photos, not as many as the keeping in touch with friends, but more definitely more than liking or favoriting. And then scrolling through other people's posts without liking or commenting on them. You're gonna be the one brave vote for that. That makes you happiest, just being able to scroll through. Okay. Now we're gonna do, now we're gonna do most unhappy. Look, I think this is wonderful because we know from social science it's never gonna be universally true, right? That may be the thing that makes him happiest, and we will respect that. Okay. Things that make you unhappiest. Gonna do the same thing again. Commenting on other people's posts. Okay, hands up at the back. I'm seeing some split opinion and tables now. So this is very interesting. Uh, keeping in touch with friends. Liking or favoriting other people's posts. Going once, going twice. We're on least happy now, just making sure everybody knows where, okay. Looking back at old photos. I feel, okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, that much of the research here was done pre-pandemic. So I think now sometimes looking at older photos is having a different impact on us. But the last one is scrolling through other people's posts without liking or commenting on them. Okay, this looks like the majority, but people are kind of unsure. You're not raising your hand as high as you did when it came to happiest. Okay, so I will tell you that the research supports the idea that looking back at old photos photos typically happiest but it's really close with using it to keep in touch with friends so when i talk with students or just talk to people generally about social media uh, use i really emphasize that uh, looking back at your old posts so long as they do have a positive emotional kind of tag to them does tend to increase well-being and using it specifically to keep in touch with friends that doesn't mean like flipping through your feed and seeing what your friends are posting, but actually communicating with them somehow. Those two uses are associated with the highest amount of well being and have been significant during the pandemic when it comes to keeping in touch with people because we have been more isolated from one another. In terms of kind of the, the greatest association with anxiety or unhappiness, Unfortunately, it is scrolling through without interacting with the, the contents. But again, there's, there's individual differences. What would you say is probably the most common use of social media of all the stuff up here? Scrolling, 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 yes. So thinking about your social media use and the proportion of time that you spend scrolling through without interacting with people in some way can often be a means of rebalancing sort of the the happiness to anxiety or unhappiness levels that you're getting from social media use. I have done this not to teach you about social media, but hopefully that will be, you know, like a great side outcome, but to demonstrate the difference between, I could have brought up a slide that said, this is what we know. These are the highest things. These are the lowest things. You will remember it better because you guessed first. You used your own experience or things that you might've known if you have, if you follow, things having to do with psychology, sociology, and technology. You brought that to your guests. You talked about it with a group. You changed, some of you changed your opinion based on what the distribution is here. And you're now more likely to remember it because you had that opportunity to guess. I know we have a lot of folks who are here who are in the science field, right? Think about the scientific method, the idea of making a prediction and then testing it. The same thing works really, really well in the classroom. Students will be more engaged. They will remember what you are teaching them better if you give them the opportunity to guess first. So in the last few minutes that I have with you today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to fix a bad slide that I'm gonna show you next. And when I say fix a bad slide, I don't mean like fix it, the number of words on the PowerPoint or anything like that. But you are going to think about how you could use the slide, which I'm gonna show you, which is presented in more lecture mode, how you could teach that content in a way that employs some of the strategies we've talked about today. Oh, I've got a heart now, yay. People are saying, yay, application. I like to do things instead of just be talked to. How could you use some of the strategies that we've talked about? There's a few more on the handout itself to teach this content. And so I'm gonna have you flip over your handout or use a different sheet if you wanna be able to reference it because I want you to jot down some ideas by hand this time. So I'll show you the slide. Oh, so much text. This just like bothers me to see. So Zoom fatigue, 
the Zoom fatigue is real, right? We all have experienced this over the past, you know, 18 months. There's a lot of really interesting science coming out about why Zoom is tiring for us and often more tiring than the same amount of time spent in a physical meeting. And these are some of the reasons why. I'm not gonna go through them in depth because the point of this exercise is how could you teach this in a way that uses some of these strategies that employs more active learning, that brings in students' experiences, their predictions, their connections to the topic. And we're gonna give you three to four minutes to jot down some ideas. I'm trying to think if there's some things I should define here. Everybody knows close-up eye contact. Self-monitoring just means like you're looking at your own face in the Zoom window. Cause you're like, oh, I didn't know I made that weird face when I spoke. Just you're constantly kind of attending to what you look like as you're talking or while other people are talking. And then nonverbal cues are things like gestures, uh, tone of voice, uh, proxemic, sort of how you're physically oriented during a meeting. We as humans rely a lot on these aspects to interpret what other people mean or to understand things in a conversation. And the thing about Zoom is that most of us are just like floating heads, right? That's a big thing I learned about Zoom recently. If you move backwards so people can see your gestures, you will be understood better on Zoom. So that's what the fourth one means. Okay, back to your notes, sorry to interrupt. Looks like most people have finished, which means I will take you to my last slide trying to follow the model that I recommend in the handout, that 555, using the very end of class, not in a sort of slew of, let me remind you of all of the stuff about the homework. You should do that closer to the beginning of class, actually, if you want students to, to uh, pay attention and to take it in. But using that last to um, reflect on one thing that you won't know that you'll use or that you wanna take with you. Jovial banter. I'm waiting to see the rash input here. I'm just keeping an eye on the, don't ask about rashes. That's what I learned today. Oh, Mentimeter, yeah. I really like uh, using this when it comes to active learning, particularly in larger sessions. Uh, the, I'm using a professional account here, but the free account does allow you to have up to seven questions, five of them like quiz-like. So if you wanted to use that for some of the content that you're teaching in class, uh, Menti can be a great tool. You don't have to have a specific click or anything like that. Students can access it through the phone or um, lots of people, five, five, five. This is, this is primacy, that's what it's called. The first thing you learn tends to stick with you. Awesome, this is great. Um, I want to let you know that I'm planning to hang around uh, during the break today. So if folks have questions about the presentation, teaching in general, NDSU or Sandy's Donuts, I'm happy to answer them. The last thing that I wanna say today is that um, when I got up this morning, I was really nervous. So I feel like what you're, I feel your nerves. This was the first in-person presentation I think I've given since early 2020. I was talking to my kids about how I was nervous and I was working through it and I was preparing and all of that. And my son, Henry, who is going into third grade, he said, mom, I know the answer. You just need to eat a garden tomato and then you will be fine. And so he went, he went out to our garden. He picked this tiny tomato. He brought it back in. He was like, here, eat this. And honestly, it didn't sound great to have before breakfast, but if your kid has the answer, you're gonna eat the tomato, right? So I ate the tomato. And he said, just keep in mind, it won't take effect for like 20 to 30 minutes. So if you feel nervous right now, it's just because the tomato isn't working yet. So because this is recorded, I wanted to let Henry know that his tomato trick worked really well and I appreciate it. But also y'all were a great audience and I'm so happy that it is you that have been sort of the folks in the room working with this material in my, my first session back. So thank you so much for your time, attention today and good luck with teaching this year.